and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us in Burlington City Hall and for this um, really, I think, unusual opportunity to have a, a screening of this film, Swallow This. Um, we are really fortunate to be joined tonight by the, the filmmakers there. For some reason, sitting in the back row, we're going to drag them up to the front soon, but we have Helen Redman and Mary Elena Marchetti, who have created this. Why don't you guys stand up and just make sure you be recognized. Thank you for being here. And, you know, you guys have come for the, the film and then discussion afterwards, and we're going to get to that in a, in a moment. I, I would like to take just a, a moment kicking things off to re reflect on why I think this is a, is a really important and timely event for what we're facing. From my perspective, we are in um, very troubling times with respect to, to the opioid crisis. It is not where I hoped or thought we would be in 2023, several years ago. The, in 20, since 2016, fighting the overdose crisis, the opioid crisis, has really been one of the city's top priorities. And um, we, for several years had a real sense of momentum and progress in thinking that we were figuring out this terrible challenge and, and turning it around. And we actually saw that in, in the numbers. We, um, we track very closely the number of people that die of drug overdoses on an annual basis. And um, after being at 34 in 2017, we saw that number drop to 17 in 2018. And it stayed there in 2019. And that was accompanied by uh, what um, I, I do think was one of the most robust, local, kind of regional, um, multi-party responses to the opioid epidemic of any region in the country. We were changing our prescribing practices dramatically. We saw the hospital reduce its prescribing by um, about 70% by some measures. We um, eliminated, after years of having waiting lists to get into medically assisted treatment, we saw those waiting lists uh, go away. Um, we opened up new ways because we found that just having no waiting list wasn't enough. We opened up new, we called the nodes to enter into the, our, our hub and spoke system in the, in the prisons with the, the state's partnership really leading that effort, but the, this region advocated hard for that. We saw our needle exchange, safe recovery, and we have a number of people who have worked in the past for safe recovery. If, I'm not sure if we have the current safe recovery people here or not. Um, we do. Great. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for being such a key partner. Uh, the needle exchange added to their services, inducting people into medically assisted treatment. The emergency room did the same thing. It it really seemed like we were you we were expanding access to the the main solution we had to this challenge, which was medically assisted treatment. And then um, 2020 hit. The pandemic arrived, and really, I think in addition to that, um, fentanyl. Uh, arrived in this area in a way that we had been spared previously, and we've really seen all of that um, uh, dramatically reverse itself to the point where now in in 2022, we saw um, over 50 people in Chittenden County die of uh, opioid-related overdoses. Statewide, I believe the figure was 237, which as a frame of reference is um, well more than double the number of total deaths that happened in 2013 statewide. Uh, and 2014 was the year that the governor started the, 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 the year by um, devoting his entire state of the state address to what he you know, called the heroin crisis at that time. So I really have this sense now that we um, have, have lost our way and we have, it, it's really quite heartbreaking and we um, need a massive effort to once again turn this around and get back on, on the right path. I think that that reversal starts by an acknowledgement, which I, frankly, I don't think we've heard clearly enough from our state leaders that our current system <clears throat> is not working. Uh, we have a lot of rightful pride about Vermont's hub and spoke system, and it and it play it, and it, it still helps many people, um, but it is it is by the state's numbers, um, and maybe there's some questions about whether this will prove to be accurate. But by the state's numbers, my understanding is of the people who died in 20. 22, only 25% of them were in the, the treatment system or had ever been in the treatment system at any point, which means, you know, we're missing a, a large majority of, of the people that we, we need to be helping. And that really, I think, should shake our sense of confidence that, um, that what we're doing is working. 
um, I think we need clarity again that this is our top public health crisis. We had clarity about that back in 20, uh, from 2014 through, through 2020. Um, we had to shift our focus, a lot of public health focus to the pandemic. In 2020, it's time for that focus to come squarely back on, on this on this crisis, and I'm hoping events like tonight uh, help help do that. Um, we also have to recognize that fentanyl has really dramatically, directly undermined the effectiveness of the medic the the this what previously was kind of our our silver bullet in this the medically assisted treatment. Um, <clears throat> Uh, suboxone, uh, buprenorphine um, is not uh, it's not nearly as effective as it was prior to 2020, which means we really have to think hard about new strategies, and that's that's also what I'm so appreciative about this film, which is it squarely focuses attention on um, the 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 treatment medicine that has remained effective in the in the fentanyl age, methadone, um, and it also, uh, my sense is, I, I haven't seen the whole film yet myself, I've seen some clips, but I think it shows us a, a really shining example of the kind of dramatic paradigm shifting new interventions that we need to be considering at this desperate moment when, um, when we really need uh, new ideas and a new direction. So again, um, we're really appreciative to have this opportunity to watch this together. Um, I think we're going to go right into this now, and then I'll be part of a, a panel that comes up to kind of just try to uh, discuss this together and its local um, implications on the other side. So thank you all for, for, for being here tonight. Lock me out. Lock me out for being a minute late. Two hours just to get to have a drink, some liquid in a cup, and then go back two hours, and then that's the way they start their day off? That's abnormal. You have to come every day until we, um, until we get to a certain amount. Never in my life would I think that this could happen in America. Our patients are with us for a long time. You really never graduate from this. The whole thing needs to go until we have a system that makes fucking sense. A separate and unequal system of care, and I'm using the civil rights language deliberately because this is an artifact of stigma against addiction. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here and watching the film with us and being part of this conversation. Um, huge shout out to Scott Pavek and Mayor Weinberger um, for championing this and really wanting it to be um, a dialogue with folks about this issue because we know that y'all are in here for a reason um, and we definitely, after we hear from our panelists, want to hear from you. Um, be it in the form of comments to share your own expertise around this issue, um, questions, but we definitely invite everyone to participate if you connected to this or have something to say. Um, yeah. So anyway, I skipped the first part. My name is Marilena Marchetti. I'm uh, one of the filmmakers. And um, what we're going to do first is start with Heidi. And I'm going to ask Heidi to introduce yourself and say why you're here and give a two, three minute reflection. And then we'll just come down the row and then move into uh, comments, questions. So let's go ahead, Thanks, Heidi. Elena. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heidi Melbastad. I'm the director of the Chittenden Clinic here um, in Burlington. It is the methadone clinic for our county. It is the only clinic. Sure. How about now? Okay, um, it's the only clinic um, for methadone in Chittenden County. Um, I am very grateful to be here. I think it's important um, for me to be here. Um, Dr. John Brooklyn is also here, who's the medical director of the clinic. Um, I appreciated one of the patients reflected on how 
different methadone clinics can be in our country, and even though they are federally regulated, um, especially in the midst of COVID, um, clinic responses was very different. So there's certainly um, things that were captured in the documentary that do happen at our clinic, and there's also a lot of ways um, that we are not similar to a lot of what you saw tonight, and I think that's really important. Um, so I'm here tonight to be able to expand all of your knowledge about what it's like for people in our community to be in treatment. Um, I'm here to build relationships with people and ultimately we want to be advocating for our patients. We want our patients to be able to live um, their best lives and especially as the mayor commented earlier, um, the overdoses keep happening in our community and we're focused so much right now on how to reduce barriers to care. And so that is why I'm here this evening. So thank you. Thanks, Marina. Well, um, let me um, echo the thanks for Scott Pavick for being the uh, city's opioid policy manager and for, for doing a lot of the heavy lifting to make it. Scott's in the back uh, and I appreciate the work he did to make tonight possible and work on this issue day in, day out. Um, I, uh, I feel very fortunate that we do have such a um, well-established and effective um, methadone clinic here in Chittenden County. Thankful for Dr. Brooklyn and his decades of leadership on this issue. Very thankful for Heidi and her she's new leadership in, in this role and um, really bringing a fresh look to what can be done to uh, reduce barriers. I. I uh, to to this life-saving medicine. Um, and we've done a lot already, and I'm conscious that many people have dedicated their lives to doing a lot uh, to move us in this direction. And um, I am taken by the um, notion that we are uh, awash with just vast volumes of fentanyl right now at a, at a level that um, uh, uh, is unprecedented and that makes access to fentanyl um, extremely um, easy uh, and immediate for many people. And I, I think we need, my sense is if we're going to turn this around, it's going to require us changing the, uh, the way we uh, offer people um, and support people into getting uh, into medically assisted treatment. and. Um, I have, for years of going with many of you, uh, having conversations about what keeps people from accessing treatment, I continue to believe that um, we still have a challenge with uh, the barriers that exist between um, uh, people staying in treatment and uh, that we have to be working on those barriers. And I think uh, um, I, I'm not completely expert to fully understand the implications of, you know, whether there are downsides of what's being advocated for here that we need to consider and grapple with, but I welcome um, really, as I said at the top, I, I think this is a moment we need pretty dramatic paradigm shifting thinking um, if we're going to uh, get back to, um, uh, uh, if we're, you know, much lower levels of uh, this kind of tragedy than what we've seen in, in recent years. Mayor. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jess Kirby. I'm here tonight. Um, I was asked to be here tonight. This is really important to me, thinking about how it, to reduce overdose deaths and thinking about how to reduce barriers to methadone treatment is um, one of the most important things that I think we need to be focusing on right now, probably the most important thing we need to be focusing on um, and thinking about reducing overdose deaths um, and keeping people alive. Um, I am a person with lived experience. Methadone was a really important part of my journey in helping me get where I am today. Um, I'm also, I work um, with people who are at risk of dying every day. I'm the director of client services at Vermont for Criminal Justice Reform and we work with really high risk people um, who are experiencing overdoses, who are at risk of overdose, um, people who have passed away, many of them. Um, and methadone is, as this film, you know, is talking to us about, the best tool that we have to keep people alive. 
um, and not enough people have access to it that need it. If I, who have been in recovery for many years and have a vehicle and a place to live and a job, and I have barriers you know, to being, a lot of barriers related to being in treatment, then people who have no place to stay and who don't have a car and who don't have a phone um, have a lot of barriers. And I work with a lot of those people. Um, there are people who try to go to the clinic for years and either just because they've been there before and they know what it entails or because it's just too hard to, you know, get yourself there um, with the way that our clinic model, you know, and, and I mean all clinic models are set up right now, um, you know, go years without treatment. And those are people that are at risk of dying every day and many who do. So I think if there's anything we can be putting our effort towards and working together and uh, about and, and, and talking about and finding ways to, to push and advocate, it's expanding access to methadone. Um, you know, buprenorphine, like the mayor has touched on, is not working in the same way um, with the fentanyl crisis that we have going on right now. The potency of the drugs has changed. Um, the culture of using drugs has changed and we have changed a lot. We have done a lot and in, in, in Vermont and in Chittenden County, we have done a lot um, to reduce barriers. We have made buprenorphine so much more accessible. Like the mayor was talking about, you know, on-demand access to treatment, same day, um, you know, harm reduction model. Like you can have your medication, of course, even if you're struggling and, and there's use involved and it didn't used to be that way. Um, we've virtual treatment. You can have a phone conversation with your provider and, and be able to get access to buprenorphine, but we have not, it does not look that way on the methadone side. Um, and so that's a really big problem. That's the medication that people are really needing more right now. A lot of people are not able to take buprenorphine and have success with it, um, even get on it, let alone have continued success with it, um, that people often do have with methadone. Um, so I just, you know, want to use my voice and my experience as somebody who has, um, you know, been kept alive by, you know, utilizing this treatment um, and working with a lot of people who really need it um, and don't have it. I want to use my voice to, you know, push for that. And I also want to say that, you know, our clinic is, I think, pretty decent, you know, compared to a lot of clinics in our country. You know, Heidi and, and others at the clinic, Dr. Brooklyn, have it is very harm reduction focused and we have come a really long way. Um, and I'm very happy and proud of that. And you know, to be a small part of that, and the, we have a client advisory board and we're working closely with leadership to like have our voices heard and you know, talk about the things that are impacting um, you know, treatment. And so you know, I do wanna say that you know, we have people at the table that care a lot about that. There are a lot of federal things that are really difficult with methadone too that we need to work on and we need to push on, so. Um, you know, happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. Don't take my picture, Cam. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, can, you can. You can. Um, my name is Helen Redman, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've worked in healthcare for well over a decade, and I worked uh, mainly with people who use drugs, and one of my jobs was to try to get them into treatment and methadone treatment. And that was my first eye-opener, um, trying to help people do that, and then them telling me what the clinic experience was like. Um, I'm also a journalist at Filter, and I write a lot about methadone. That's sort of, I'm on the methadone train. Uh, so um, that is my uh, specialty. And I'm also a filmmaker, and this is our second film about methadone. Our first film is called Liquid Handcuffs, a documentary to free methadone. And we went around the world to see how other countries deliver methadone. And some were very similar and some were very different, which we'll hopefully have time to talk about. The reason I'm here is I want to free methadone. I want to free the people who take methadone because with the methadone clinic system in existence, you cannot be free. You cannot be free because you're not in constant possession of your medication. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's behind a plexiglass wall in a massive safe and a nurse doles out a certain amount to you, either on a daily basis or if you can earn the privilege of take homes, you can get more. So foundationally, you're not a free person if you're not in possession of your medication. And I think a lot of people in this room probably take medication. I count myself among them. And the thought of a clinic system controlling access, and I get more, and then the bottle recall, and they're taken away. You cannot be free when you have a clinic system. 
The other thing about not being free is you're not free to move about. As Samantha said, you go to New York, there's a bottle recall. You lose your medication. You want to go to another state for a wedding or a funeral. You have to ask the clinic to get more take-homes. They have to approve time away from the clinic. You're not free when you have to ask a clinic system if you can leave the state or go to another town and get more take-homes. And, you know, Zach Talbot, who's featured in the film, he's the president of the National Alliance for Medication-Assisted Recovery. They have a grievance process, and they have received a ton of grievances around this very issue of the bottle recall. I was out of state. I lost all my take-homes. My business, I have to travel. I can't get back, right? Um, so you're not free to move about the country. Your, your movement is restricted. You're, that's wrong, in my opinion. And the last way you're not free, and I've noticed this, especially in my journalism and talking to a lot of people who take methadone from across the country, they don't feel that they can speak out because they're afraid of retaliation. You know, the people in our film are brave. They just said, to hell with it. I don't care if my clinic retaliates against me for criticizing them. So the, the First Amendment right to free speech, people are afraid to speak out. They won't go on the record with me for filter, a lot of people. Uh, webinars we want to have, they're like, the camera can't be turned on. So you're not free, and that's what we have to do. And in order to do that, we have to end the clinic system and move to prescription parity, which means you go and pick it up at the pharmacy. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so we want to hear from you. Comments, questions, anyone who wants to break the ice? <laughs> I won't call on anyone, don't worry. <laughs> Will, would you like to say? Aaron, do you want to? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just sort of picking up on your mention of international examples of doing things differently, Helen, and um, um, returning to, to what the mayor said about um, being unsure whether what's being advocated for has downsides. Um, it's worth noting, isn't it, that the, um, the system that, that Biz was advocating for of, of pharmacy pickup does, to a large degree, exist in other countries, um, like the UK and Australia, for example. And there, um, you don't have methadone segregated from the rest of the healthcare system. You don't have mandatory counseling, et cetera. And while those systems themselves could improve, um, the, the result of those systems is not um, diversion and methadone-involved overdoses. So it is, it is actually happening and working in practice in other places. Thank you, Will. Maybe we'll take some more. We don't have to come back on everything, yeah, so let's see if some more folks. Thank you for coming here. I just wonder, because um, people are able to receive methadone prescriptions, just not for opiate use disorder. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about, you know, depending on your diagnosis, you have access to this. Thank you. Heidi, would you wanna, would you wanna address that? You can say no. I can try. I can try. I think. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think that it's a good point, and I think at the clinic, um, I think what you're talking about, Heather, is if somebody has um, pain issues, right, or other issues, and it, and it is different. There is no doubt about that. That if somebody is treated for pain, they're going to get a prescription from their provider, and they don't necessarily have to come to the clinic. Um, and I think it speaks to the discrimination that we know historically has existed when it comes to people that are in treatment for substance use disorders. Any other thoughts? I'll just say quickly that I wanted to touch on this when I was talking that, you know, yes, we need to get closer, I think, to a model like you were talking about, about 
being able to pick it up at a pharmacy like any other medication. But it's also like we're not even close to that at all. Like there's never a point where you can get to that point. Like people that are in recovery for many, many, many years that whose lives are, are very stable, they have not had substance use in sometimes decades, can never get to the point where they can do that. Be prescribed by a, a doctor or, you know, pick it up at a pharmacy. Like, you know, even if some people don't agree that everyone should be doing that, it's like you can never get to that point when it feels like trust. You can never get to the point of earning trust that I lose a bottle, I should be able to tell somebody, you know, what's going on or, you know, and, and that it should be okay. And that's not anything on our our chitin clinic specifically, that's the, the model of methadone that you never get to that point. And it's just 100% based on stigma and I, I just wanted to say that part that for people that don't really understand how this really works like it's like I think some people think like well you get there and you get stabilized and everything like that and you know but that's not how it is for people on methadone it's a f f the whole a forever thing the whole time that you're on methadone you're at the clinic on that level of supervision um, and it's it's really harmful and really deters people from wanting to be on it and stay on it who really need it you know many people get off methadone or don't get on methadone not because they don't want it and the medication part doesn't work but because they can't or won't understandably because they don't feel free do the rest of the stuff that comes with it so I just wanted to say that um, before so Thanks, Jess. Mm -hmm. And I would add, here in this county, there's only one clinic. Yep. So there is no choice that the patient has. They have one place to go to receive methadone. We have another uh, comment or question. Some clarification on, is your name Lisa? I can barely see. Me? Yeah. Jess. Jess, OK. Some clarification on what you were just discussing on what recovery looks like. Are you saying that methadone is a forever, it's a, it's a lifetime, it's a lifestyle, or does there ever come a point for um, those patients in opiate recovery where they don't have to go to the clinic and that is what their recovery looks like? I don't exactly, I, I, I see where you're going, but I'm not seeing the total end game. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that methadone is definitely a lifetime thing for people. Some people it is. It, that's very individual. Like, you know, that depends on the person, how long they stay on methadone. And for a lot of people, it is for a lifetime. Um, <clears throat> I'm more saying that with a lot of treatment models for drug treatment, you know, they have this model that's like a step and a stage and, and you move towards, you know, more flexibility and that kind of thing. But in a clinic model, maybe you are on methadone and even if you're very stable, there's a lot of reasons to stay on methadone, you know, like it's a medication you take a once a day and why not stay on a medication that you take once a day that's working for you and things are going well in your life and you're healthy and all of these things, but that you can never get to the point where you don't have to do everything that comes with the clinic. You know, so that's more the part that I'm speaking to that maybe things are really stable and you, it would work much better for your life and you might be more comfortable being on methadone longer term if it's working for you. Um, if you didn't have to continue to go to a, a clinic and have that level of, of supervision and restriction and lack of freedom, but you, you don't have an option to like eventually go to a lower level of care, you know, and be treated by a medical provider at, a, at your primary care, which you could do for buprenorphine. So am I answering your question? Um, let, let, me, let me add something here. It, it's what Carlos said in the film. You never really graduate from this. As long as you need methadone to treat your addiction, you cannot get out of the clinic system. There's no way out. And that's why people call it liquid handcuffs. That's why people call it parole in perpetuity. They use carceral terms because it's a carceral system. So no, you can never get out of the system as long as you're gonna to need to take methadone for addiction. If you need methadone for pain, you can pick it up at the pharmacy. They've really uh, put in a lot of restrictions now because they're cracking down on pain patients. Doctors are dumping pain patients. The rate of suicide has gone up. We have a crisis in this country around pain medication. And the clinic system is not helping us to end the overdose crisis. So you can never get out of the clinic system. D does that ans answer it?
Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, sure. Um, right. <clears throat> I think that opioid use disorder. Why are you saying why would someone stay on? You're saying why wouldn't people <clears throat> get off the medication? Is that kind of what you're saying? Well, Is that if they're stable and why are they doing well and they're doing well? Does anyone at the clinic really believe that? folks don't need the prescription for methadone at some point, like that's recovery for them and they no longer have the urgency to take opiates even for pain? Or is it that everybody is under their thumb and somebody actually, I don't remember the exact reference, but somebody said that they, they couldn't tell if the practitioners were trying to help them or harm them do you see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. being under the thumb of the clinic? Can I take a... Like maybe some okay. people don't realize that they could recover and they wouldn't have the urgency to use opiates. Yeah. So I think, you're, I think your question is speaks to what does treatment for opioid use disorder look like? And for many people, um, medication is a part of the treatment for opioid use disorder, but that is not the only treatment for opioid use disorder. And there are people that have an opioid use disorder that don't receive medication. And so that conversation is with the provider of what does treatment look like for you and what makes the most sense for, for the patient. Um, so at, at our clinic, there's conversations with the medical provider because some people don't want to be on medication anymore and they decide not to be. And then there's a protocol to like safely reduce the medication so that ultimately they stop taking it and they have other supports in place for their recovery. And then they're no longer um, our patient because all of our patients take medication for opioid use disorder. So they get treatment from other places in the community if they want it. And there is another part I feel like I have to say as a person that has <clears throat> been on methadone for a really long time is that people are on methadone that don't have an urge to use opioids. Like just because you're still on methadone doesn't mean that you're still having an urge to use opioids. I'm not for many, many, many years. Um, but it also is you still are opioid dependent, you know? So it is rocking the boat and really messing with your life and causing you pain and suffering to come off of a medication that is really challenging to come off. There are protocols, but it is very, very hard. And so you're back again to the, this is a treatment for a medical illness that I have. It's a medication that I take once a day. I am not craving opioids, but because I will have these impacts if I come off of this, I'm going to stay on and take a medication that I take once a day and keep my life moving, you know, and that's, you know, what it is. But just people that are often on and still very stable and not having a, a craving for opioids. But yeah, I think really the answer is that it looks different for everyone. You know, some people use this protocol and come off and, 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 and that's totally fine. And some people don't and they're, and they're on, you know, and that's how they treat their opioid use disorder. So we've got a bunch of questions, but before we move forward, I just want to say, for the record, Carlos, the counselor, calls people addicts, um, but that is a very harmful way to describe people, and we never want to call people addicts. Um, we could say people who use drugs, people with substance use disorder, I believe, but this, these terms are all changing, but at the end of the day, it's people-centered first, the person and then the thing, but what Carlos said, we're, we don't endorse, but that's your counselor for you, so y'all got to see that. Um, so we had some questions over here, maybe we'll take a, a group of questions and then I wanna get you mayor, you're coming back, you're next, and then everyone here is gonna talk and yeah. <clears throat> this is just a quick one. What federally, what's the least restrictive level you can be at at the clinic? Is it monthly take homes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But not every state allows that. Just a question about fentanyl. 
does <clears throat> does methadone work equally well for people who are using fentanyl, or is fentanyl in some way a barrier to the state of mind that would uh, allow someone to approach treatment? Let's put a pin in that one, and here's some more questions, and we'll, we're going to do a bulk answering. Uh, thank you guys for coming. This has been awesome. Uh, my partner and I are both prescribers, and uh, but one of us had to put the baby to bed. <laughs> How could we film? The, can we purchase this film? Can we stream it? I would love that information before we all go tonight. There was a and I have a quick question. Um, I often hear Suboxone and buprenorphine and methadone. Um, I personally don't know what the difference is, and I think you made some reference to the efficacy of those different um, treatments. So could you say more about that? These are great questions. We're going to break it all down. I can get the folks over here, yeah? And then we'll come. Thank you so much, awesome film. Thank you all for being here. Question for the filmmakers, how did you get awesome stories? How did you get people to talk? That I imagine develops a lot of you need time and trust. And I thank you for capturing those stories because we wouldn't hear them otherwise. Anyone else over here? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for being here and putting on this, this movie. And I really appreciated the shout out to other models in other countries and then also following with that there isn't actually, there's data around that not contributing to diversion, right? So I think something that we have seen in the state that we are so terrified of is diversion. And this comes, you know, talking about methadone, but also buprenorphine, suboxone. So why, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but like, why are we so afraid of diversion? I would much rather have methadone and buprenorphine out there than people accessing fentanyl. There's no argument in my opinion that can be made, but I would love to be, I mean, I don't want to be convinced otherwise, but I would love to hear <laughs> why. I think we have two more over here. Two more, and then, okay, we'll do you, you over there, and then we're gonna go back. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get a better sense for um, someone trying to access methadone at one of the clinics in Vermont, just what are the, the, um, the nature of the requirements, you know, that create these barriers in terms of the frequency of testing, the frequency of counseling, the types of things that someone has to go through on a daily, weekly basis as part of the red tape or barriers in order to access at a clinic. Thank you. Okay. So I heard um, somebody talk to them, um, refer to themselves as an owner of a clinic in your film. And that kind of surprised me um, that people own these clinics. Um, and so I'm curious to know, is that a, a predominant method of, you know, of ownership of these clinics? or um, my sense was that they were more publicly nonprofit supported, et cetera. Um, and that leads me to my, my real question is, what are the barriers and hurdles to changing the system? You present a tremendous argument for change in this country. Um, and it, listening to an owner makes me curious, are there vested interests that are standing in the way mm -hmm. of evolution and change? I can tell you, um, growing up in the 70s, I was very familiar with the methadone clinic in the town I grew up in, and it doesn't seem like it's a lot different than, than the things you presented here today. Mm. So I'd be curious to learn more if I could. Thanks. Do you still have a question? <clears throat> You're good. Do we have anyone else? Thank you. Similar to the last question, I'm just curious, what is the path forward to create options for methadone to be available through pharmacies for people? Beautiful, thank you. Do you want me to review any themes that we heard or you guys got it? Uh, <laughs> You're ready? M Mayor, should we go? I wrote it down. <laughs> um, let's try. Uh, in, in some ways I feel like um, maybe the least qualified person up here although I've been listening to these conversations for many years about um, the differences between um, 
the different medications uh, and why they're really significant right now. Um, I could take a stab at it, but I, I'm wondering, do you think, Heidi, could you, I think kind of to establish kind of baseline, I want to come back to the diversion. I do want to weigh in on diversion, but um, before that, maybe speaking about why fentanyl has so undercut, undercut the effectiveness of buprenorphine, um, whereas uh, we don't feel that way about methadone. So I think to your question, so fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than other opioids such as heroin or even methadone. So we have two main medications, buprenorphine and methadone. Um, they function, they're both opioids, but they function a little bit differently at the opioid receptor in the brain. So methadone is occupies the entire part of the receptor. It's a full agonist. Buprenorphine only occupies part of the receptor. So that means that other opioids can kick it out of the receptor, if that makes sense. So what you're talking about, Mayor, is the reason why there's been such a decrease in recent years for the interest in buprenorphine is because if you are still using opioids, when you take those opioids and then you take buprenorphine, the other opioids will kick the buprenorphine out of the receptor and you will experience withdrawal symptoms. So I think a lot of things kind of happened in concert. So with the rise in fentanyl, with the rise, I think, in our communities of like more destabilization and COVID, more and more people continued to take opioids as they entered treatment. And so because of that, the interest and the use of methadone increased because that withdrawal that happens with buprenorphine if you continue to use doesn't occur with methadone. Okay. And Taboxone is the um, trade name for buprenorphine? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Well, <clears throat> Well, since we're focused in on that, it, it's it's a little more than that too, right? In that Suboxone is buprenorphine in in, the, in a combination form with naloxone, and there's a whole other debate that maybe is sort of beyond. Um, maybe we should avoid getting into today, but there there's there's an interesting debate there too whether um, uh, many people do not uh, um, have a positive experience with that combined drug, and I think there's. Uh, an argument for why we should be moving away from Suboxone, which has been, I think it's fair to say, the state's preferred f form of buprenorphine to um, uh, to kind of separate and just have uh, buprenorphine available. Um, so to try to keep sort of uh, moving along the questions that were asked here, I, the um, I think at a basic level, the answer to the question in the back about what would be necessary to achieve this kind of change to go to go to this pharmacy model, as the film advocates, would require federal action. Is, is my understanding that that basically the the rules that regulate the hubs are are, are, are that regulate the methadone clinics, which we call hubs here, are um, are federal rules, and you would need you would need congressional action, uh, or at least presidential action, to to make a change there. I do think it's important to note that. Um, there is support for kind of a step along that trajectory, <clears throat> um, something that Heidi and I have been working on and that the legislature just passed a significant appropriation for using some of the new settlement money that is coming into the system that um, is basically putting money into the system uh, statewide, two and a half million dollars, two million dollars explicitly to try to um, ease um, uh, acts, you know, to, to respond to this conversation to ex and to uh, um, ex expand access to methadone. Um, I don't think we've reached a conclusion exactly what that's going to look like here in Chittenden County, but um, one of, and it could be, a, and maybe I should let you speak to what you are thinking that the best way to make those investments are currently. Um, uh, and uh, so there's active work going on there that, that we think we can do without federal action. And so we'll have Heidi speak to that in a moment. I, I, I'll turn it over for that. Let me just say, I, I feel like what I said before maybe came out a little um, wishier, washier than I attended, and that I, I really am largely in agreement with the sentiment noted that too much of our policy um, with uh, <clears throat> our, our, our uh, opioid medications is driven by fear of diversion. Um, it is, uh, it is, uh, um, continues to be, you know, from my, 
from my take on, on the data, uh, you know, I, I'm with you. We are awash in fentanyl, and um, we, uh, we, we need to step away from having so much of our state policy driven by that, that fear of diversion. I think that we've had a lot of debate about that with respect to, to buprenorphine, and I f feel um, really quite confident that we... Um, uh, we need to make substantial changes to our policy uh, there. This discussion of diversion, you know, fent uh, methadone has been in, this is really one of the first discussions I've been in where we've been talking about such a dramatic change to the way um, methadone is dispensed. And so I, I am interested, and in, you know, I know there are people in the room that I think have real concerns about what um, opening up uh, the system in this way might cost. So I, I do think it's a little bit of a new discussion to be talking about really just abolishing the, the clinics entirely. So uh, I would like to hear more about that, but I got my sentiment is strongly in the camp that um, there are very few um, kind of opioid naive people who are being um, in do who are starting down the road of addiction based on uh, methadone or buprenorphine um, consumption, and that really is fundamentally the fear. And I think that that fear is uh, has has way way too much weight in in our policy decisions. We got to move away from it. So, with that, maybe could you speak a little bit about what you think we should be doing on the on the on the methadone side, Heidi? And I might need your help, Marley. And others, I, all, these are all really great questions. Maybe just sort of organized. So I think maybe I'll start with um, your question in the back. So in the state of Vermont, we have um, eight hubs or methadone clinics throughout the state. Um, in our county, um, it's run by Howard Center, which is a community mental health organization. Um, in other counties, um, the clinic is run by a private organization. So that question about there, there are private entities that own clinics. They're here in our county. There are private organizations, for-profit organizations that provide buprenorphine. Um, so it just depends. There's a lot of variability. Um, I think one of the silver linings from COVID was the, the leniency that occurred because of the federal mandates and the emergency declaration, like the folks in the, the movie talked about, people who weren't eligible for take-homes in the past to be able to have medication once a week, every other week, a month, um, were el suddenly eligible. And I think that provided this really nice insight to like, almost experiment that the diversion that people were so afraid of d didn't occur. That hundreds of thousands of children weren't suddenly dying because they got a hold of methadone or buprenorphine. Um, so I always take that as a silver lining. I think that's what we needed because SAMHSA, our, the federal entity, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Organization for our country, is looking at the data and they are the ones that have the power to change these regulations. We are federally regulated, so I agree that these medications are what we need to save lives, but as a clinic, we still need to have diversion control policies. And that is, that's law. Um, and so Dr. Brooklyn and I and the rest of the leadership staff, um, since COVID, um, the, May 11th just happened, and that's when the emergency dec declaration ended. Um, SAMHSA very surprisingly removed all the restrictions that we thought we were gonna go back to and has put a lot of the power and authority into the local clinics and to the medical providers being able to assess risk for patients. And so that's a really good thing for us. That means that many, many more people are getting medication weekly, every other week, monthly. Um, I think to the mayor's point, this opi the opioid abatement money, um, part of where some of that money might be designated is we might open um, what we call medication units. So for instance, in our county, the Howard Center and the Chittenden Clinic would still ultimately operate these facilities, but they would essentially exist as pharmacies so that people wouldn't have to come to the clinic every time to get their medication, they could go to another location. Um, that I think is important because we have a lot of folks that travel a long way to get to Burlington, we're a, a really big county, and transportation is a really big barrier to care. What am I missing? Thank you so much for all that you just said and kind of transitioning us into the end of our program. Um, so we had a really great conversation that kind of started with understanding, okay, what exactly is this medication? 
what does it look like in our locale? And there seemed to be some sentiment that this has to go. How do we change it? What's the path forward? Um, so I want to hear from Helen and Jess to give us some final remarks. Um, but before that, if you want to watch this film, we have a website. You can see it online. Pick up a little postcard at the um, table over there. It has all the info. Um, and obviously, this was the beginning of a conversation. It seems like it could go, go on a lot longer. I wish we had more time. But we have just under 10 minutes. So maybe we'll hear from um, Jess or Helen. Y'all can jump in every now and then. But you guys uh, bring us home, yeah? Sure. OK. Who's first? You go. Oh, okay. Um, well, good, because I think you probably have important stuff about what we need to do and can do about this. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'll just say, you know, I agree with everything everyone has said. You know, I really hope that we can get to a place where we can help people access medication better. I think I, I love, you know, the idea and, and advocated strongly for, um, you know, us to have like satellite lo locations and other places for people to access methadone. So I really hope that people in our community are gonna be able to access methadone that way and that that helps more people get it. I really hope that we can um, expand hours. That's one of the main things with clinics that is a huge barrier to people all across the country is um, very strict hours that are in early morning. And that's really hard for a lot of people. So I think um, if we can move towards that, I know for sure, you know, I work with a lot of people who miss doses, you know, daily, weekly. Um, because they know they're going to be late and, and, and they won't be able to be dosed. So um, I think that that's another huge way that we could be helping people do that. And I just, you know, as a person that's in a position to tell people about this medication, I just hope people, you know, can understand that, um, you know, it takes a lot to be in treatment. It's a huge step to take for people. Um, it saves a lot of lives. We still have a lot of stigma. It's hard to talk about this stuff for people, like they were saying mm -hmm. for me. Um, but it is way, uh, you know, understanding more about it and being a part of helping people have medication they need is directly saving lives. And, you know, stigma kills people in that way. And so I hope that people can try to, you know, open their minds to this idea, learn more about it, understand that, you know, this is a medication that sometimes people need for a lifetime and sometimes they don't, and that's totally individual. But we, this is the biggest public health emergency we have, and um, we really need to do better with helping people access this comfortably and um, easily and um, be supported by our community. Thank you, Jess. You're welcome. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that we have to stop talking about diversion and overdose when we talk about methadone because those are DEA talking points. The Drug Enforcement Administration is a police organization that's carrying out a worldwide war on drugs, and that's a war on people. And this is what the DEA has been saying for 40 or 50 years, diversion, overdose, diversion, overdose. And for me, we didn't even need a pandemic to know that that is not what is going on. People who take methadone, they want to take methadone. It makes their lives possible and better. There's lots of other drugs people don't want to take, but methadone is not one of them. So I, will, I don't even want to talk about diversion and overdose, and especially because the DEA is actually responsible for the fentanyl apocalypse that we're living through right now. People are dying because they're overdosing on fentanyl, not methadone. So we have to stop, we have to stop those DEA uh, talking points. And unfortunately, the DEA is centrally involved in regulating methadone clinics. Um, they regulate them, they terrorize doctors, uh, people who, doctors who, uh, medical directors of clinics have told me they're afraid of the DEA. You know, the DEA creates a, 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 an atmosphere of fear and control, and then that, they kick down onto the patients. So we have to get the DEA out of drug treatment. What is a police agency doing? involved in, in methadone or buprenorphine or anything else. They're, they're carrying out the war on drugs. So we have to get them out. Um, the other thing I want to say is, you know, people should know in other countries, they do things differently and it actually works. So in Vancouver, it's a small pilot program, but they're um, doing fentanyl maintenance. 
give people the fentanyl if that's what they need to stay safe and not overdose and die. In lots of countries in Europe, there's heroin prescription. You go and get your heroin, right? Why can't we do that here? The DEA is one of the major um, reasons. Now, the next point I'm going to make is very depressing, but it's true. The DEA has always had the power to change methadone regulations. So they could have said 40 years ago, any, any doctor, any healthcare provider can provide can prescribe methadone. They have the power to do that. So recently, researchers at Washington State University did a study founded by, um, funded by Pew Trust, and they looked at all the regs. And so they found the DEA and SAMHSA, they've had the power for decades to change these onerous regulations, and they've chosen not to, but they can. So the DEA can change the regulation to say any healthcare provider can prescribe methadone. This is what we know now, and, and the pandemic helped uncover a lot of this. It's just regulatory insanity. It's like, it's the most regulated drug in the pharmacopoeia. Why? Because of discrimination against people who use uh, opioids. And so it's going to be a fight to move to prescription parity. There's no question about it, because the DEA is involved. And there are for-profit methadone clinics like Baymark who make a lot of profit. And you know the way they make the profit? Is people coming every day. So there's a, a financial disincentive to say, oh, we'll see you once a month. Well, that's not gonna make them any money. And this is where profit comes in. And I'm not okay with that. When 100,000 people died last year, and God knows how many are going to die this year. That is not okay. But we already know these for-profit methadone chains, they're going to fight any kind of progressive change. So we have to wage a fight against them. And we're working to put together a national coalition who wants prescription parity. You know, there's 60,000-plus pharmacies in the United States. Guess how many methadone clinics there are? About 1,900. And to build a methadone clinic and to go through the DEA, um, you know, they have to license it and all that. Forget about it. That's not going to happen. And so for me, big problems need big solutions. But in a way, this isn't a heavy lift. We have 60,000 pharmacies. Methadone is already there for, for folks who have pain. So that's what we have to do. We have to fight. We have to fight to free methadone, to free people on methadone. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Pick up a postcard over there. Hope to see you around. <laughs>